The Union of Soviet Socialist Republics dissolved more than 30 years ago. We can argue over why. Gorbachev said it was Chernobyl, some say it was the fall of the Berlin Wall, others say it was blue jeans and Coca-Cola, capitalism, that did the deed. But some people still, to this day, believe USSR propaganda. What's more, amidst the war in Ukraine, the troubling trend of tankies actually defending the USSR is growing. So today we'll try to understand why, then debunk those myths. Myth number one, nobody starved. Let's be clear up front. In some ways, life in the Soviet Union was better than it had been in Tsarist Russia. But we're going to argue that communism had a two-pronged effect. It both put a ceiling on how much better the average person's life could get, and it lowered the floor, making times of suffering even worse. We'll start in the early 30s, where the famine the USSR inflicted, known as Holodomor, literally death by hunger in Ukrainian, resulted in the deaths of millions. What's worse, Holodomor was only one of several famines the USSR's brutal brand of communism caused. We'll go through them all. Together, they explode myth number one, that food was plentiful in Soviet Russia, and that nobody starved. In the early 30s, rural farmers and villagers comprised about 80% of Ukraine's population. And as with all top-down centralized government structures, the people furthest away from the capital and furthest away from power were the ones who bore the brunt. Between 3.5 and 7 million people died in Holodomor. How? Joseph Stalin and the Communist Party of the Soviet Union are largely to blame. When they observed that Ukraine was gaining strength and autonomy, they sought to nip any potential independence movement in the bud. Stalin's five-year plan gave the Soviet state control over Ukraine's agriculture, namely its supply of grain. Ukrainian farmers were forced to sell not only their grain, but also their land, livestock, and tools to the government, and were enslaved on government collective farms, known as kolkhozes. The forced sale of products to the Soviet state acted like a price control, because the state didn't have to compete with other buyers. And as we've shown with apartments in big cities and generators during natural disasters, price controls lead to shortages because they disincentivize production. See the card for our videos on that. And sure enough, by the time Stalin's plan was brought to full scale June of 1933, about 28,000 Ukrainian farmers were dying per day of starvation. I wish I could say that was the only instance that debunks the food was plentiful myth in the USSR. But no. Previously, there had been the famine of 1921 and 22, during which, according to best estimates, about 5 million people starved. That famine, too, had been brought on by a Soviet policy that forced farmers to sell their produce to the state in certain quotas. Again, because the state didn't have to compete with other buyers, it could pay whatever it wanted, usually very little. And guess what? That led to shortages. In part, Vladimir Lenin's new economic policy, which allowed farmers to sell some of their produce privately, helped bring this famine to an end. For about 10 years, before Stalin's aforementioned five-year plan eliminated even that sliver of a market economy. But Moscow's central planning wasn't done choking off and distorting the necessary economic signals of price, supply, and demand that generally lead to rising standards of living. And it wasn't done inflicting suffering and death on the country of Ukraine. Because after World War II there, a drought put tremendous strains on agriculture. Were farmers' quotas on grain and other products eased or lowered? Of course not. And so Ukrainian farmers had to work harder and harder for less and less harvest while seeing what little grain they did produce confiscated and sent to Soviet-controlled Poland, Czechoslovakia, and Bulgaria. 
Even if we give Stalin an undeserved benefit of the doubt and say that his government was just trying to distribute resources most effectively, those central planning efforts run into F.A. Hayek's knowledge problem. The knowledge we must use never exists in concentrated or integrated form, but only as dispersed bits of incomplete and frequently contradictory knowledge which all the separate individuals possess. He goes on to say that attempts to concentrate all this knowledge into a single planner or planning board are at best inefficient and at worst impossible. And when inefficiency happens in agriculture, it means not enough food, which equals starvation. Myth number two, there was no social inequality. I honestly find it hard to believe that people actually think there was no class struggle or social inequality in the USSR. Maybe this is why. The official Soviet constitution of 1977 said, the state helps enhance the social homogeneity of society, namely the elimination of class differences. Because notice, if someone is in charge of enhancing social homogeneity and eliminating class differences, then that person or group or board is, by definition, more powerful. Here I'm reminded of Orwell's line from Animal Farm, his satire of Stalinist Russia, that all animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. The structure communism creates is inherently unequal, and the Soviet constitution of 1936 had even explicitly divided the Soviet population into two major classes, the working class and peasantry, and a third group, the intelligentsia, called stratum. Far from a flat, equal societal structure, the USSR looked more like this. A head of state, Stalin at the top, the ruling elite, a couple levels of intelligentsia, then high-skilled labor, and all the way down to low-skilled workers, peasants, and slaves. For starters, due to inefficiency and shortages, even buying a piece of furniture could require years on a waiting list. In effect, only high-ranking party officials enjoyed any level of luxury. Moreover, check this out. Mervyn Matthews in the book Poverty in the Soviet Union defined elites as those who earned 400 to 500 rubles a month in 1972 terms. That was more than three times the average of Soviet wage earners. According to this definition, how many elites were there? About 0.2% of all employees. And people complain that free markets lead to inequality. And hey, sometimes they can, but they also allow the non-elites to improve their lives. Communism doesn't. To be clear, inequality isn't inherently a bad thing. Just because a tree is bigger and gets more sunlight than a bush, doesn't mean the tree is better or more valuable to the forest. But let's be honest, a big part of what attracts people to communism is the equality it allegedly produces. The USSR, while promising the elimination of class differences in that 77 constitution, became, as a professor of political sociology put it, a system of entrenched economic and social inequality. Myth number three, the USSR was democratic. This is one that, in researching, I was shocked to find that people actually believe. There's a notion out there that the USSR was democratic, that political participation was high, civil liberties were prioritized, and the rule of law was foremost. It blew my mind to learn that in Russian, Soviet means council. So Soviet Union means a union of councils. Factories and small villages were a council, or a Soviet at the most local level. In theory, they voted for representatives to serve in a larger town Soviet, which would elect representatives to serve in a regional Soviet, provincial Soviet, and so on, all the way up to the Supreme Soviet of the USSR. So in theory, this system gave a voice and a vote to every member of the proletariat or working class. In the 1940s, an estimated 1 million USSR citizens participated in this system of Soviets. And again, in theory, anyone could rise through the system. But in practice is where this myth of Soviet democracy falls apart. Because in practice, all decisions had to be approved by the only legal political party, the communists. 
and none of the Soviets could do anything that contradicted the head of the party. Moreover, the top-level Soviet, the Supreme Soviet, very rarely met, and when it wasn't in session, its power went to something called the Presidium. You can guess who controlled that. So it's not a stretch to say that the Supreme Soviet was a facade orchestrated by the Communist Party to give the proletariat the sense that they could meaningfully participate in some kind of democracy. Besides, and this surprised me too, the Soviets had a totally different definition of democracy. Take the Western concept of democracy, typically expressed along the lines of Lincoln's formula, government of the people, by the people, and for the people. Well, in the Soviet Union, that concept couldn't exist. You could have a government of people, consisting of a dictatorship of the proletariat, but in the USSR, you could never see a government by the people, because for them, the government came first. Before people could even consider themselves people, the government got to decide who was a person and what their real needs were. So to summarize, the USSR was democratic. If you totally redefine the term, add the qualifier in theory, and then squint really hard. But come on, as the term exists in the world today, there's no argument to be made that the USSR was democratic. Myth number four, the USSR eliminated poverty. This one's pretty sad, honestly, the myth that poverty didn't exist in the USSR. Full disclosure, my conception of the USSR was always that it was forever mired in some kind of permanent, perpetual Great Depression. Here's where I'm coming at this from. I'm a big hockey fan and also a big fan of chess. I know, I know, call me a nerd in the comments if you must, but because the Soviet Union produced some unbelievable hockey players and chess champions in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, I've read books, watched documentaries, and listened to interviews with some of them. Guys like Garry Kasparov and Slava Fetisov, I've heard them describe in their own words the awful conditions they grew up in. So I don't understand how anyone could think the USSR eliminated poverty. What I can see is the argument that poverty in general was less in the USSR than it was under the Tsars from about 1721 until 1917. But the USSR's reign coincides with a massive reduction in poverty throughout the globe as technology, communication, and trade got better and quicker. The key is, compared to the West, poverty in the USSR stayed worse for longer and its GDP grew slower. In effect, the societal structure put a glass ceiling on how much of the global growth the USSR could take part in and enjoy. And after digging deeper, I can see there was a broad and concerted effort on the Soviets' part to conceal the poverty there. Stalin himself suppressed the publication of data around negative social phenomena, even having the compilers of the 1937 census arrested. And even after Nikita Khrushchev eased up a bit on the censorship, the term poor couldn't be used in official Soviet publications. What constituted poverty was also pushed far below the West's standard. That 1986 book, Poverty in the Soviet Union, found the application of American poverty standards to Soviet society would result in a far larger Soviet poverty contingent. And this is especially despicable. As part of the whitewashing effort, Soviet police ensured that homeless folks were nearly invisible. They were pushed out of the streets of Moscow and toward dark cemeteries, empty construction sites, and the ventilation pipes and heating ducts of unfinished and abandoned basements. But not even Stalin could hide the truth forever. And now we know, roughly, just how bad it got in the Soviet Union. In 1974, the government had introduced a subsidy for families making less than 50 rubles per month. Using that definition, the government's own, this article estimated about 40% of the entire Soviet population in 1967 would have been considered in poverty. But even beyond income, the Washington Post said it well. Poverty in the Soviet Union is reflected less in salary levels than in daily unending shortages. 
Families share a toilet and a kitchen and take turns complaining to blank-eyed local officials about the rusted pipes. Evenings after work, they stand endlessly in lines, hunting for milk, oatmeal, toilet paper. It haunts the heart as well as the stomach. Myth number five, the USSR had excellent health care. This myth I actually can see how someone might into because, well, I've heard the same thing from Canadian friends about their universal healthcare system and how it's so much better than what we have in the US. But once more with this myth, we run into the problem of definitions. The USSR's health system couldn't have been universal because it gave some people, the privileged and the powered, better care than others. I mean, tell me if this sounds universal. There were special hospitals and sanatoriums for the Ministry of Defense and the Ministry of Transportation. And there were special healthcare units for high-ranking Communist Party officials. Back to Orwell, right? All animals are equal, but some are more equal than others. Now, it is true that the Soviet healthcare system was free for all citizens and even boasted the highest number of hospital beds and doctors per citizen in the world. Of course, doctors was a loose term, those pesky definitions again. They counted nurses and paramedics. Hospitals, if you can call them that, were overbooked, with patients sitting in strollers in the hallways. Bribery was common too. If you wanted decent medical care, you probably had to grease the wheels with money. And so naturally, people with money had an advantage. Or you could bribe with liquor. And speaking of liquor, alcohol abuse and alcoholism have long been severe issues in Russia. According to one study, before the fall of the Berlin Wall, Soviet consumers drank more than 17 liters of pure alcohol equivalent per person each year, ranking first in the world in consumption. But get this, although in general consumers found it difficult to get the goods they wanted regardless of their disposable income, Vodka and other alcoholic beverages were one of few readily available consumer items in the USSR. That's because the Soviet government depended on alcohol for a good chunk of its revenue. And as you know, if you've ever gotten drunk on an empty stomach, alcohol is even more physiologically damaging when you haven't eaten, which as we've covered, Soviet citizens didn't always get to do. Myth number six the USSR had excellent education. In healthcare, as we established, just because something is free, that is taxpayer funded, doesn't mean it's good. And as we've hit on time and time again, the Soviets had the tendency to uh, get creative with their definitions to fit their state glorifying narratives. So too with education. Now, one might think the Soviets had a solid educational system because, yes, they produced a strong core of engineers, for example. I mentioned their great chess and hockey programs, which made the USSR look good at international competitions. And yeah, they had a strong military. However, the term education, as we generally use it, implies a certain well-roundedness. Math, science, history, literature, electives. But well-roundedness was not an aspect of Soviet education. For starters, there was little room for individual choice. The choice was made by the ruling party, which made as the focal point of the educational system, the training of people to carry out its program of rapid economic, political, and military expansion. So if we want to be generous, we could say Soviet education was all about specialization. But if we don't care about being generous, we could use the term indoctrination. As the Quality of Life report detailed in the 1970s, a 10-year complete and universal secondary education was rolled out on the state level. But what were students actually learning? Schools were required to educate the youth in the spirit of unrestrained love for the motherland and devotion to Soviet authority. School children learned about the superiority of Soviet biology over bourgeois biology. And speaking of biology, men and women learned different things. Boys got military training, girls learned homemaking and motherhood. What little they learned about other countries came through an ideological lens too. Hamlet, for example, was portrayed as an expose on decadent court aristocracy. 
Moreover, because this 10-year program had to be completed by all students no matter what, teachers were incentivized to just push them through. As a result, the Quality of Life report said, most teachers have simply relaxed their grading practices so that few students fail. In 1981, it found only one-third of 1% 1 of students repeated that year's grade. Accordingly, it concluded, the proportion of unskilled workers is very high for an industrialized nation. Myth number seven, quality of life in the USSR was high. Speaking of workers, in a country so deeply influenced by Karl Marx's infamous closing line, workers of the world unite, surely the working man's quality of life was looked after, right? But unless you were one of the higher ups in the communist party, quality of life was downright drab. While the relative cost for some products in the Soviet Union was comparable to their counterparts in cities like Paris and Washington DC, and while a few things were even a little cheaper, other things cost many times more. Basic consumer goods and housing in the USSR were also scarce, that is, scarcely available unless you had connections or influence within the political structure. And the goods that were available weren't all that good. Take bicycles and furniture, for example. In 1963, the State Trade Inspection found that 68% of bicycles and 34.7% of furniture didn't meet its quality standards, which, given what we know about Soviet definitions, probably were pretty low to begin with. As Mervyn Matthews pointed out, Soviet living standards were primitive by Western standards, and also compared unfavorably with much of Eastern Europe. He added, only 65% of all Soviet households had refrigerators, compared to more than 90% in the US, 85% in Spain, and 80% in Poland. And in the USSR, only 55% of households had washing machines, whereas 74% in the US had them, 90% in Italy, and 80% in Yugoslavia. And I couldn't resist including this little detail because it explodes the myth that blue collar workers specifically were taken care of. During the Great Depression, when workers were already suffering plenty, from October 1929 until about June of 1940, the Neprarivka, or Continuous Working Week, rewrote the entire calendar. It established a five day cycle with each day color coded and marked with a politically appropriate symbol. Workers were divided into five groups, each with its own rest day, singular, not a two-day weekend. One historian hypothesized that the Neprarivka sought to undermine the family because instead of a man and his wife having two days off in common, they only had a one in five chance of having one common day off. It also made me wonder if that was the actual goal, to amplify the importance of the state by diminishing the importance of the family. Myth number eight, minorities were protected in the USSR. There's one more myth we want to debunk, and it goes hand in hand with the general perception of communism, the hippie-ish notion of everyone living together in peace and harmony. And technically, officially, the Soviet Union and Eastern Bloc were raceless. They even recruited African students to study technology and engineering. But interracial relationships and sex were stigmatized throughout the Soviet era, and Soviet women generally were not allowed to follow their African partners back out of the country. Moreover, Chechens, Crimean Tatars, and the Volga Germans, among others, were deported under Stalin. And according to an analysis of minorities in Eastern Europe shortly after the fall of the Berlin Wall, during the assimilation campaign of 1984 and 85 in Bulgaria, which was part of the Eastern Bloc, authorities forced inhabitants of Turkish villages to change their names, sometimes at literal gunpoint, to something more Bulgarian. Or take the hidden ethnic cleansing of Muslims, which took place during World War II. The Journal of Contemporary History reported that several Muslim ethnic groups were brutally deported from their homeland republics and forced to live in exile in Siberia and Central Asia. How about other kinds of minorities? Well, in 1934, Stalin received a letter asking, can a homosexual be worthy of membership in the Communist Party? 
the writer of the letter was protesting Article 121, which had just prohibited men lying with men and punished it with imprisonment for up to five years. Reportedly, Stalin read the letter and commented, he's an idiot and a degenerate, and probably tossed the letter right in the fire. By the 1980s, there were about a thousand arrests every year under Article 121. And more broadly, not only did the USSR create an environment hostile to minorities, but by going to such great lengths to kneecap markets, it eliminated the crucial process of buying and selling with people of other cultures and identities. In many ways, it's that process which helps create trust among different groups. So no, Soviet Russia was not a haven for minorities, or some beacon for intercultural and interracial harmony. Okay, so we've debunked the myth that nobody starved in the USSR, the myth that there was little to no inequality or poverty, the myth that the USSR was democratic, that it had good health care, that it had good education, that it placed a premium on workers' quality of life, and that it was some kind of safe haven for minorities. We've seen how it redefined words and standards to avoid humiliation, and how it stifled the improvement of quality of life the rest of the world was enjoying throughout the 20th century, and how it exacerbated the effects of droughts and depressions. There might always be apologists for the Soviet Union and defenders of communism. There will be people who say the murders and genocides inflicted by the USSR are somehow different from the murders and genocides elsewhere because they were in some kind of noble pursuit of equality. But here's what we can learn. Whenever someone or some political party seeks power, of course they'll tell you it's in the noble pursuit of equality, or ending poverty, or providing universal health care and education, or that it's for the common good. But as the USSR demonstrated, the people who most desperately want to change the world are usually the ones most interested in running it. And often, they'll run it straight into the ground.